Hello, hello. Welcome to my new podcast, From Grind to Grace, episode. And if you are not new to this podcast, you know that I talk a lot about how to create freedom as an entrepreneur in the process and get the results as a byproduct. Needless to say that in our society and the way the industry is, People are used to doing things differently. They imagine they will get the results and then then they will get the freedom. However, that's not how it normally goes. And if you are not new to the entrepreneurship, you know that in order to do the thing, to be able to do the thing, you need to become the person who can do the thing. And that's a huge piece of my podcast the question is how do you do that the question is do you know what steps you need to take to achieve that and the question is is there so much trash in your head that you don't even know how to deal with for which reason i have an amazing guest on on today's episode i'm very 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 excited and she's smiling right there and from the very first moment we met we were all giggly and playful and and that's exactly what i expect you to create in your business and that's how i expect you to feel as you listen to my podcast and as you meet my amazing guests and Today's guest is Alexia. So meet Alexia. She's the founder of Head Trash Clearance. How amazing is that? It's a game-changing self-healing method born from her personal journey. As a business coach grappling with tocophobia, I'm not sure if if I'm saying this right, tocophobia, right? I hadn't heard this word before the fear of pregnancy and childbirth. She expected a C-section. Instead, she conquered her fear in just three months, opting for a home birth and an experience that led her to create her own powerful technique. Her success fueled the fear-free childbirth podcast, quickly attracting a global audience in over 180 countries and 1. million downloads. Recognized as a tocophobia expert, Alexia expanded her method to tackle anxiety, depression, and OCD, offering entrepreneurs and high achievers a way to clear mental blocks and optimize performance. With a strong background in brand marketing, she authorized fearless birthing and clear your head trash, turning her method into actionable strategies that help entrepreneurs thrive. Alexia's journey is a testament to the power of confronting fears, transforming challenges into growth opportunities and building a brand that resonates deeply with those committed to personal and professional excellence. Very welcome on my show, Alexia. I'm super excited to have you to speak about this important topic from such an interesting angle and i can't wait to hear what's what's going to come out of it well thank you for the invite i can't wait to dive in yeah and i know that i I, and i was telling you before i hit record that i made your intro a little shorter you i know you have a very powerful story that I think brought me to tears a little bit. I think we we giggled and then we kind of shed some tears on our, when we first met as well. And um, I think a lot of people can resonate with a struggle like that, not necessarily specifically in relation to pregnancy, but can you see parallels? And I think there is a reason probably why you developed the method that you developed for entrepreneurs, to help entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. I mean, the fear, fear doesn't care what it, what the fear is, right? It, it's always trying to protect you in some way. And I think understanding that fear is is it's on your side it's not out to get you (laughs) it's out there to protect you 
and and there's something that it's trying to protect you from. So for me, with my tocophobia, which is, it's not just oh, I'm a little bit scared of birth. It's I don't think I can handle this. I need to be knocked out cold. You know, those those it affects over thirty percent of women, not not thirty percent of pregnant women, but women. So a lot of women avoid pregnancy and becoming mothers altogether because they simply can't even think about it. It's so terrifying. So I just want people to understand that tocophobia isn't just, you know, it's it's quite a se severe condition. And those that suffer with it a lot, it really does affect their lives in quite difficult ways. And that's why I ended up working with anxiety, with OCD, with depression, because it, you know, if you imagine that you can't stand the sight of a pregnant woman and it triggers you into a panic attack, what does that mean for your life in terms of being able to go shopping, being able to go to family events, you know, like, going out in the world. I mean, how often do you see a woman with a pram or a pregnant woman? So these, this is, this is how um, impactful that condition can be. I didn't have it to that degree, but nevertheless, it was huge. And those kind of fears also step in and stop women from being more visible in their business or from making the sales phone calls or, you know, doing whatever it might be in your business. There can be certain conditions or certain things, that you, activities you have to do that you simply cannot face because of the fear that's behind it but sometimes more often than not you don't know why you have that fear and you don't even realize that you're not doing the thing so you might be busy tinkering with your website behind the scenes or spending ages on your redesigning your logo right because you're not doing the thing that's really going to move the needle but you don't even realize you're not doing that because as far as you're concerned you're busy working on your business but then you're not seeing the sales come through and it's because you're just avoiding this whole other section that is that isn't even in your mind's eye because it's been blocked out and that's probably because mm. of the fear that's going on so even though I had this fear of birth when I started applying my method to my own business fears my goodness I mean there was plenty to be there was plenty of work there to be done because I had a lot of fear around so many different facets of my business um so yeah the, the journey of conquering your fears doesn't just reside in pockets of your life. It's kind of everywhere for most of us, I'd say. I'm getting goosebumps, uh, goosebumps uh, as you talk, especially when you said we're not aware sometimes of things that are stopping us. And we're not even aware that we we have a fear. And as entrepreneurs, we struggle to admit those kind of things as well. So we kind of, as we do think we get into this closed loop where you know one triggers the other and then and it goes on and on and on and we just can't and we get lost in that right yeah, yeah. and so from this point actually i want to kind of go into two different directions but i think maybe we can combine both so one direction is a little bit of your story because i think a lot can be learned from your you know story how you discovered this and developed this method that maybe if you could be a little bit vulnerable about the darkest experiences that you experienced, then I'm, I'm asking for that because I know a lot of people experience those things and a lot of people are afraid to talk about mm -hmm. that. On the flip side, I, I and you know, I'm hearing that those kind of stories help people, as you know. On the flip side, I you mentioned that it can be useful to have fear, which sounds a little, might sound a little unexpected and controversial for people. Mm. So I would like to kind of dive into that as well. And maybe you can sort of like, as we speak, you can combine the two. Let's mm. see. But maybe let's start with your story. Yeah. So I, I was a business coach doing great work as far as I was concerned, having had a background in corporate marketing. And then I got pregnant by accident. And when I realized I was pregnant, I my just, I felt this huge pit of despair come over me, it just felt like I was just engulfed. And it for a few weeks, I was just navigating this sense of deadness inside, a kind of real darkness and heavy weight that was just, it was awful. Um, and I was in and out of the hospital a lot to try and we were having scans and, and all of that. And then within 
I don't know, within two or three weeks, just as I was getting used to the idea of being pregnant, we found out that we lost the baby. So I had a miscarriage at around seven weeks. And when I found out that I had a miscarriage, there was, yes, there was that gut, gut punch of, oh, but then there was this huge wave of relief. Oh, and I was like, Ooh, well, at least I don't have to go through that. <laughs> And I was like, whoa, what the hell is wrong with you? How can you experience relief at a miscarriage? What is wrong with you? And so this really sent me down a line of inquiry as to what was wrong with me. Like, how could I experience relief at a miscarriage? So in other words, you were sort of blaming yourself, like cry beating yourself up for that? Well, no, I, I was trying to understand. I thought I was really messed up. I was like, how is it possible for a woman to feel relief at a miscarriage mm. when most women... One, they get really excited when they're pregnant. And two, they're absolutely distraught when they miscarry. And I was experiencing the opposite. So what the hell was that? And now I'd not long lost my mum very suddenly to cancer. So I was still wrestling with a lot of grief, like really hardcore grief and anxiety because I <laughs> because I was a mess and bouts of depression. So I was I was a mess emotionally, mentally anyway. So I, I kind of just figured it was like my anxiety just putting me in a tailspin um, and I didn't know that there was this thing called tocophobia which is the fear of pregnancy and birth the pathological fear of pregnancy and birth that leads to the avoidance of pregnancy mm. and birth and so here I was in my mid-30s having very well avoided all conversations about babies even though I had a long-term partner and suddenly got pregnant by accident <laughs> so it's no accident that I was in this situation because I not even had we'd not even had the baby conversation even though we've been together seven years which in itself is weird, right? And so now, now here I was pregnant. And so then I lost the baby. And so I spend the next, I don't know, six months, a year, just addressing my anxiety. I was like, I've got to get to the bottom of this. What the hell is wrong with me? I don't, and I, I didn't like that feeling of being, being, yeah, just being so unhappy and so deeply desperately in a place of darkness and so I then started addressing my anxiety and I, I did a reasonably good job because by the time I got pregnant a year later instead of thinking oh my god I can't handle this bury me now like hide me in a hole I can't handle it now I was like okay right okay I've got to sort this out right I can do this I can I can find a way and there's got to be a way around this I, I can I can deal with it I can so there was a there was a, a definite shift in my perspective that is reflective of what happens when you raise your consciousness, shift your consciousness. And I went from below, you know, this disempowering position where everything was pulling me down to I was now in a place where I felt I had a little bit of courage, a little bit of willingness to kind of like move forward and try and solve it. So I didn't know how, but the, the spark of desire was there to try and sort this out. Whereas before it wasn't, it was just take me out of it. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm curious, what was that moment? What triggered you that moment? I talk about, I like talking about empowerment a lot. And I think this is one of the biggest thing for entrepreneurs as well, to be able to be able to do the thing, like yeah. feeling empowered inside instead of, you know, based on someone else's validation. For me, it, it's as I'm realizing now with the work that I do, and as I further develop my healing modality, is that the healing that I'm able to do with my method does shift my consciousness and raises consciousness very quickly. So the work that I'd done, the preliminary work that I'd done in that period of time was significant enough to bring me from a place of disempowerment where, and if anybody's familiar with the map of consciousness by Dr. David R. Hawkins, I was below the 200 level. I was wrestling with severe anxiety, mm -hmm. wrestling with depression. Mm -hmm. So I was in the realms of, you know, on a scale around 150, 160, 170, those kind of numbers, which is where everything feels like you're walking through glue and you can't, you need somebody else to pull you out. Whereas I'd managed to flip myself over into above 200, which is a place of empowerment, which is where you now have the energy within you to start moving forwards yourself. You might not be able to move very fast, but you have something within you that can now move you forward. You don't need to be pulled and along. Does that I make don't sense? Think you, and I don't think you're talking about that sort of labor as in like energy that enables you physically to think. You're talking about that, what is it called? You know, the energy that's that's always there, right? 
and yeah. we sh all should have access to it. Yeah, except we don't because it's drowning under this weight of heavy, toxic emotional energy that means it can't even see the light of day. So the minute you start healing and clearing away that stuff, it can start to come through. It can start to kind of, you, you start having access to it, but I still didn't have a lot of access to it, but there was a little bit coming through and I could start drawing off it. You know, if you imagine that you're kind of, your car's been you're driven off of a bridge and you're in the river and suddenly like there's, you, know, you can't breathe and suddenly I found a pocket of air and I could keep myself going enough to start winding the window down and getting out the car. Whereas before I was like, this car's going down and I'm going down with it. So now I felt there's a, a there was some life force coming within me that I can now tap into. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It's very, very interesting. And then on that next point, you know, when you, um, you felt so much fear. First of all, I'm curious, did you feel fear of pregnancy before you got pregnant or it just hit you when you discovered you were? Yeah, no, I didn't even like, because I never even, because this is when I talk about blocking things out, I didn't even know that I had this fear until I saw the pregnancy test. But and even then I didn't there. know that that was a fear of pregnancy. I didn't know what I was dealing with. And so, but obviously that fear was acting behind the scenes and doing stuff. So it meant that I never had a conversation about babies and family with partners. And I was like, oh, I'm the career girl. I'm going to do my work. Mm. It was directing my decisions from behind the scenes. And I didn't know that that was the thing that was directing my decisions. Now, if you think about that in your business, how many of the things that you're doing without even realizing that are being controlled by fear that you don't even know you've got? That, that that's how that that's how powerful fear can be. Yeah, Sid. Oh my God, this this makes so much sense and it's so insightful. The fear was there. It was always there. Except you were not aware of it. Yeah. And I just imagine how we are all affected by something. Yeah. If we don't, oh my God. And this is one one reason people need coaches, people need mentors, people need healers. One they need healers. 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 Especially like you know, and of course, in the context of this podcast and what I'm talking about, especially healers, because people are not able to look at themselves the same way. Oh, wow, wow, wow. I love this. This is so powerful. And so then, let me, but there's something else that I want to touch on here that I've noticed the more I work with business women, and I can't have, because of my work in birth and pregnancy, having worked in that field, I still work in it, but I was specializing in it for eight, eight, nine years, that the, I'm always interested and I'm always asking my uh, business clients, what was your birth like? What was your mother's pregnancy like? Um, and if you are a mother or you have been pregnant, what were those experiences like, right? Because they are like your own birth is, is instrumental because it, it puts down an emotional blueprint for your life. So my tocophobia, the root trauma for my tocophobia was my own birth, which I have no recollection about, right? But it, it that was why I, that's where it, all that came from. And it is that for many, but some people have got puberty trauma, some people it's other kind of trauma. But the thing that I've been really picking up on a lot recently is those that have got a history of abortion in their family. So whether it's their abortions or their mothers have had abortions or whatever, there might be an ancestral pattern or history of that. And how this shows up is really quite incredible, is that a lot of women find that they hit a plateau, they hit a, a level where they don't go any further, but they are sabotaging. It's like they are aborting their project mm -hmm. they are aborting the creative life force that they're injecting in their business they're, they're killing it basically and these women are hitting these levels and they don't know why they're not going further they don't know why they can't seem to get the traction they don't know why they hit a level and then we heal then i found out they've had an abortion then we do the healing and suddenly boom, stuff happens in lightning speed because it's like that life force energy has now got an outlet and it comes oh out Would and it has so something? far yeah, would you say a miscarriage could cause something similar? Potentially, but there's a different, there's a slight, it does have a an impact, but it's got a slightly different flavour. It, it manifests slightly differently. Oh my because God. the important thing there is that there was the decision that she's made. 
And so obviously that's not an easy decision to make. And I've worked with a lot of women that have made that decision because they're so terrified of birth. So I've worked with women that are so terrified they've aborted the baby that they want. I've had one client and she did that three times and told her husband that she had a miscarriage every time because she couldn't, she, she was like, I can't handle pregnancy. I'm going to kill, I'm gonna, I feel suicidal. I can't do it. It's me or the baby. I have to, I have to get out of this situation. I, you know, it's so interesting. And probably we can draw some parallels between pregnancy and having a baby and, and having, you know, starting and running a, a business as business. well. There are a lot of like these days and back in the day when I didn't have children, I I remember there used to be sort of a birth gurus and whatever, and they were promoting sort of natural birth thing and you know those kind of things, which sounds kind of cool on the surface. To me, it sounded so horrible and I was so afraid of even that topic, really. Because I think when you just go touch on that on such a surface level and just push these women, you you gotta do this, you gotta do this naturally, you gotta this and that and without an addressing whatever underlying fear problem can be can be so dangerous. And I think is the same kind of situation in in your business as well. Mm-hmm. Like we keep we keep hearing push it, grind force it do it anyway you know do those things you're not inspired what who cares you know and and especially for women right i think it it might be i did feel guilty because i i was getting up in the morning and i was telling myself i'm gonna do this and that i'm gonna reach out i'm gonna make calls and then i end up not doing it and i was obviously i was feeling guilty but obviously there were other problems i needed to get solved first right Mm, yeah. So on that pair and how useful it is, tell me more about it. On the which fear is that the fear of not- uh, as in in general that fear can be useful. Oh, so fear can be very useful. Like when I think about how fear has served me in my life, I wouldn't be doing the work I'm doing now if it wasn't for my fear. So it was the fear that that has led me to do everything that I'm doing. And and I, I relentlessly hunt my fears down now. And, and it really annoys me that I've got blind spots still because I can't clear them. <laughs> I need somebody else to highlight them to me because sometimes it's really hard for you to highlight your own, to, to notice your own blind spots. But for me, like, if you think about fear, one thing that I think we need to get clear on is how we define fear because there's, there's fear and anxiety and often they use interchangeably mm. and often a lot of the fears that we have are actually just anxiety because fear really is when there is clear and present danger so mm. if you are in a situation where there might be a threat to your life or safety then fear kicks up to kind of go hey like there's something going on here you need to be aware of don't go too near the end of the cliff because you might fall off and die don't go down that dark alley because you've just your subconscious has picked up on some footsteps down there and that that that's potentially dangerous. So don't go down there. Whereas the problem is that we've kind of we imagine a lot of this stuff, even when we're not in actual danger or any threat to safety. And that's really anxiety. But we kind of call that fear, too. So we have to kind of be clear on what is fear and what is not. But at the end of the day, who cares whether we call it a fear or anxiety? It's just knowing that there are these things that are hemming you in that are keeping you contained in a a limited space because you don't want to move forward in any direction because you might hit one of your fears or anxieties that are keeping you hemmed in. So sometimes they serve you well and and they force you to do your research to, you know, when I work with women around the birth and their pregnancy preparation, it's like, well, what are you scared of? Well, okay, I'm worried about, you know, the pain in birth. Okay, well, why don't you research pain in birth to find out what is going on there? Once you understand the nature of pain in childbirth, they don't, you don't, fear it because you understand it so a lot of fears are actually fears of the unknown so the minute you start educating yourself learning more about something you immediately it loses its fear capacity because you now know about it now you can eyeball it so in the context of business people like oh I'm worried about my numbers I'm worried about doing my you know my sales figures or you know I don't worry I don't want like my spreadsheet well okay learn about numbers learn about profit loss accounts like speak to your accountant do have those conversations so that you can now you know about it. You don't you don't worry about logging into Stripe every month or whatever it is. Right. Mm-hmm. So use your fear to guide you in terms of what do I need to learn about next 
because then you won't fear it in the same way. Maybe there is a, a an irrational fear going on there that could be that could have a root in trauma. So, for example, I was working with a business person, and they really wanted to scale their business. They had a very successful business doing sound healing and frequency healing, and but they couldn't scale it. So every time they stopped work, they would just stop. So they needed something that they could scale, but they couldn't scale. They couldn't put the things in place that would enable them to scale their business, and. So obviously, I'm you know my background in business, and I, I'm a real business geek, and I love spreadsheets and scaling and and, and all of that because you know that, that's kind of what I've done a lot in my business life, and and I was curious to under to, to discover that this person, their childhood was very chaotic. They had a mother that was very um, so the single parent. It was messy house. She was a bit of a hoarder. There was loads of stuff everywhere, and so you couldn't put anything away. So their room was this little solitary place of quietness and neatness in a house of chaos. And so now they found themselves not being able to put anything in place. But when they were a child, nothing was in its place. They couldn't put anything in place because it was so messy because it didn't have a place. Mm -hmm. And that same pattern was now showing up in their business, in their inability to put things in place. So when we healed that trauma, suddenly, boom, 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 Things are happening. They can put things in place because they were blocking. There's a huge block over putting things in place, which sounds crazy. But actually, that the language of that was, that's the key between, one, helping them to feel organized and not chaotic around what they had to do, but also to be able to do the necessary thing, which is put a structure in, because they had no structure in their upbringing. Mm -hmm. So to ignore your, you know, this is why I think it's essential for business leaders to have a healer in their back pocket because you just don't know how your childhood traumas or unresolved wounds or whatever you want to call them, how they're showing up in your business and stopping you from doing what you need to do in order to generate the revenue, have the impact, scale, build a team, whatever it is that you want to do. You need to start hunting down your wounds. It's like it's imperative. Yeah, yeah. I you know I'm so happy we're talking about because and I'm seeing the trends in the industry that this field is growing. This field yeah. of energy in many different modalities is growing. We need more people to hear those things, you know, and we need to counteract the old school. Yeah, personal development. Some of it can be good, some of it, you know, has its its limitations, I believe. But um Correct me if I'm wrong, you know, what you're saying and what, what I was thinking, you know, uh, as you were speaking, that the fascinating piece here also is that everything is available already. Like when you know you were talking about everything started falling into places from where, right? It's so amazing how actually it's here. It's already here around us. We just need to sort some, some things out. And so my question to you is, do you believe that every person, every single person has something to sort out within? Absolutely. I, I don't think we'll find anybody that doesn't have any healing to do because there's ancestral trauma that we've all picked up on through, through our family line. There's the life that we've lived. There's our in utero experience. There's our birth experience. There's past life trauma. Like you're not going to find anybody that hasn't got anything in all of that <laughs> to heal, right? Most people, the reason why we've got a mental health crisis, the reason why most people are wrestling with anxiety and depression and can't sleep well and have health problems. And, and I mean, I could go on, but don't have mental energy that need coffee to function. All of those things are signs of a need to heal and release stuff inside and so yeah we've all got that to do it's whether or not we want to do it and whether or not we want to build a spiritual backbone that means we can get down and do the work that's required to build the life that we want a lot of people can't be bothered because it's too much effort because it requires work because actually hard work triggers them boredom triggers them effort triggers them they're actually lazy they don't realize it i've had several clients so i've said you know what the problem here is that you're lazy and they're like what i was like yeah so then we healed their laziness thing and suddenly they're like, oh my God, I can't believe how lazy I was. I was avoiding all this stuff. I didn't. And then suddenly they, they're able to get down and 
do the work, you know, because building a business requires grafting. It does require effort on some level. You can't just think it's all going to drop in. You do still need to create some solid foundations so that things can drop in and land on something. If you haven't got a foundation for them to fall on, to land on, they're just going to fall through the cracks. So you still have to build a solid foundation. So there, there, there is a part of effort that is required. You can't just magnetize this stuff in. But once you've put that foundation in, hell yes, that stuff can come flying in. But not until you've built the container for it. Otherwise, it'll just fly right past you, right? You've got to kind of build your thing that it can land into. So doing that is necessary. And some people can't can't do that, even though they want to. To be able to do that does require them to confront a few home truths, a few fears, a few wounds, and to do the work. And not everyone's up for that, unfortunately. But many are, right? And those that are, they're my tribe because, yeah, there's magic to be done. There's magic to be to be released that's once you do magic. that on a healing work, right? That's it. It looks that's like magic, it. but it isn't. It's just because you're aligned that's and you're able to like use your intuition, tap into it, take aligned action, not get in your own way. And people, when you are operating from that place, your energy is different. People just want to kind of engage with you, be with you, come to you. And so the opportunities come towards you in a way that they don't when you're like, you know, wrestling with your stuff and you've got a darker energy and a heavy energy. People don't want to engage with that. And this is all on a very subconscious level. No one will kind of say, oh, I don't want to talk to you because your energy is meh. Or they might say that to somebody else, but they might not say that to you. And so these are things that we discern that we pick up. Mm. So really, and, and I, I see this a lot with the clients I work with when I, you know, one of the things I do is I, I have a program that is all about healing with the, with a view to raising your level of consciousness. And when you hit a certain level of consciousness, that stuff kicks in. And so, and it's incredible how much I see that happen. The minute they flip over to a certain level, things just start working for them. Mm. Things just start falling in. It doesn't necessarily mean that things happen in a linear fashion because the life is not like that. But I they think it doesn't the, at all. I think it doesn't no. at all. And our industry teaches us that it needs to be linear. And that's yeah. when we get stuck, right? Yeah. yeah. Because with the linear is not the, the linear is what people at a lower level of consciousness want. When you're at the beginning of your when you have a lot of stress and anxiety, you need to know, well, if I do that, then this happens. And I've got my six month plan, and then this is going to happen, and I'm going to do this, and I know that I'm going to do that because it's going to lead to this, which is linear. Whereas when you're outside of the need to control, you need you, you don't you don't have a fear of change, you don't have a fear of uncertainty, you don't have a need to know what's going on, you don't have a need to understand everything. You don't have a need to plan. You don't have a need to prepare. These are all things that keep people hemmed in. Yeah. Maybe you're free of that. You can follow the intuitive nudge that says, hey, go and do that random thing that makes no sense. And instead of going, no, that makes no sense. I'm not going to do that because that doesn't fit my six-month plan. You go, hey, I'm going to do that weird thing. And then lo and behold, you do the weird thing. Suddenly an opportunity comes in. You meet so-and-so and boof, you're off in a new direction and you've managed to quantum leap in your business mm -hmm. that you would never have seen mm -hmm. or imagined or, yeah, you would have yeah. discounted it because you would have said no to your intuition that knows way more than you ever will. And it's like, for me, you know, uh, I was thinking, you know, of an analogy of, I don't know, a plant, uh, uh, let's say a, a, a tree sprouting, right? You know, there's a sprout and it tries to go up and then there's a rock and a boom, you know. So what, what is it? Oops, wrong way. Go the yeah. other way, you know, still try, but don't try to get through that bleeding rock you know, not, yeah. not, but I think that's uh, most entrepreneurs, that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to get through that rock that is in their way instead of just trying uh, yeah. something else. And I think some gurus are preaching that, stick to it. Yeah. Finish what you started, you know, those kind of things. So I think a little bit, I'm very happy to see that we are sort of redefining that personal growth or whatever it's called now you know, field, because a lot of that stuff, uh, mainstream stuff and even manifestations, I remember I used to try to manifest. It's not working. It actually it makes me feel worse. Until I found out, you know what? There is something in my body that disagrees with that and creates more conflict, mm -hmm. you know? And when I discovered that, oh my god oh my god this is the answer you know and i don't manifest those, the things the same way anyway because i think a lot of that is ego work what ego wants you know the this mm. the 
the number, the whatever. I don't know, you know, and the real thing is beyond the ego, it's the essence, it's whatever drives it, everything. And I think if people could understand that, I think they would become successful much faster, even yeah. if they get the results, the yeah. actual whatever results, right? Yeah, yeah. So how do you how do you think somebody could try and explore what the hell is kind of stopping them? Where 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 does somebody even start? That is a very good question, and to be honest, I think it's going to be different for a lot of people because so, so. and it's going to. I think it, the best way of doing that is to work with somebody else that can spot that in you because it's going to be so hard to see that in yourself, but you can look for clues, right? You can look for clues where, what are the things that you keep trying to do that you're not succeeding? The elusive goal, like where do you keep trying to do something and it never works out despite your best efforts? What is that thing that is not happening? Those are the kind of clues to look for because they can you can start digging there. Then also look for things where you don't feel, like I, I allow myself to be guided by how it feels here. So if you're moving in a direction that just doesn't feel great here, then ask yourself, why is it you're pursuing that direction? What is it about this that, that makes you that, that, that makes you feel that? And try and dissect the reason for the, the heavy feeling that you might be picking up on. Like, if you feel like, yeah, this is great, I'm going to go here, then, hey, this is a great idea, do it, right? But if you're like, Ugh, every time you think about it, there's something about that route that, that is not great for you. What is it? Is it the destination? Is it where this is taking you? Mm -hmm. Or is it some of those activities or tasks that you need mm -hmm. to do that are the problem? So maybe break it down into task levels so that you can go, is it that, is it that, is it that? But again, this requires, this is a lot of conscious stuff that people just don't have access to because it's all subconscious, a lot of this stuff. If you haven't figured it out, the chances are there's subconscious stuff going on, whether it's fears, unhealed wounds, pattern in a conflict where there's a part of you that wants to go over here and there's a part of you that wants to go over here and you're like ah, and you could just get stuck between these two forces that are kind of pulling in opposite directions and that creates a stuckness for you it's very hard for people to spot that for themselves so th this is what i spot in my clients and they and i go there's a you've got a conflict going on between this and this and they're like oh Oh, and you can just see the penny drop. They go, oh my God, and they realize, oh my God. But they never saw it. They never saw it. So I think it, it is hard to spot that for yourself, but look for the clues. So look into how you feel about things, look into the things that just keep escaping you. And that can really set you off into a line of inquiry that can give you some, some progress. Yeah, and so true. And the beauty of it is that you can actually start feeling in your business like you have achieved something straight away. Yeah when you shift some stuff like for example how i started this podcast you know a lot of gurus preach and yes we do need to make decisions at certain points but when something really clicks and that was the case with my podcast as well in that moment i knew and it, the the downline that i was getting was not even about the podcast it was a sort of a side note that podcast is done that's how it went. It's not like I was sitting there and pulling myself and, you know, I need to start. I actually, you know, it was like done. And then I remember one day like, okay, so I decided, okay, I decided I'm going to record my solo episodes on Mondays, right? Monday comes, I don't feel like it. Okay, I don't record it. Tuesday comes, I don't feel like it. Wednesday comes, I brush my teeth and I have that whisk and I hear the whisper, brush your teeth, record this stuff. And I went to, and I brushed my teeth and I straight away unplanned, I recorded my solo episode about, I can't remember which one now, but uh, it was so easy, so light, so inspiring, you know, it, it's just like, didn't feel like work. I used to think, okay, Sundays I don't work. I don't even look at social, nothing like that. I used to sort of um, sort of protect myself from overworking when I became conscious that I was in the grind, you know, that was a while ago. Now, I don't care if I look at, at the social or at some messages on Sunday. 
it just flows. I don't feel like it's work. It's fun. Yeah. Now, yeah. right? <laughs> totally. Absolutely. And and the, this this feeling, I think it's really important to, to, to act when you do have that energetic hit. Because the same, when you are operating at this level, it is all about the energy. And so even if you, if you record a podcast episode and you're not in the right energy, don't do it. Like, so I've got to now, like, do certain tasks when I've got the right energy in me. Mm. So I, there's no point me mapping out my week going, well, first two hours of the day, you've got to write your content. Second two hours of the day, you're going to be doing this. Because it, it doesn't work. There's so many times I've got there to, to do what I'm doing. I'm like, no, I don't feel like it. Don't It doesn't fit. It's not flowing. And then other days I'm like, I can't stop writing content. I'm just like, oh my goodness. And then suddenly, and that happened recently and it became a book. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I couldn't stop it coming. It was just like, oh my God, I feel so inspired right now. I've got so much to say. And other days I'm like, I've got no idea what to put on Facebook. No idea. And other days I literally can't stop writing. So I've got to work with the energy. And, and so that means that plans are out the window. There's an intention. And I work with intentions now, not plans, because plans are just too rigid. And I can't, they, I found them too restrictive. And and also, yeah, I, I just can't do that now. So I, I, I work oh, in it. I feel like I'm more like water in that way. It was for ages like that for me. You know, I post content because I have to. I do seven videos a, a week because I have to. And I got into that routine, right? And it was cool. It was okay. But it was always feeling off. And you made a very good point. Not only does it feel easier for you, but it also radiates that energy that is required to hook your audience, to get your audience to resonate with you. And you reminded me, I, I say sometimes your, your energy is your best marketing hook. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's beautiful that way as well, because if it's flat, if you are just doing it because the, your, your post calendar, your content calendar is saying you, you post about this today, whatever motivational stuff, whatever. <laughs> it's very really, it does it just doesn't work that way right no. so so i i absolutely love this topic and 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 all this energy stuff and i'm so glad that people like you know are spreading the message and it's it's interesting that a lot of entrepreneurs actually are feeling that something that are doing you know is off and they're not stepping into their power or not finding their power or they could be playing bigger but they're not playing bigger you know and i and i thought you know maybe i was the only like that who felt off and you know inauthentic or whatever you know i did a good job logically from the logical part of me i did a good job i became a, you know great copywriter marketer whatever but but it's just like it, it didn't feel like and so the power of now that book I'm actually I'm listening to right now, it says in that book that, um, and that was exactly the case for me, and maybe it's gonna help other people too. It said that there are two types of people um, in this world: people who, so all people crave the feeling of wholeness, right? But uh, some people are conscious about it. Some people are not conscious about it. The people who are conscious about it, that there is something missing, they experience emotions of lack of self-worth. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God. And like, you know, so when we speak, you know, all the strategies, all the expertise, copywriting, oh my God, skills like crazy. And I was still not feeling confident. Mm. Yeah. which actually wasn't even about confidence it, it, it was about feeling of self-worth or lack of it mm. you know so that was such an, such an amazing thing to to uncover do you have anything to say about that specific topic especially the feeling of self-worth and what does it mean to you yeah I think there's a there's a lot of so there's two sides of this when I think about this or that I want to get across there's one aspect of it which is that feeling within you where you just don't feel good enough and you do feel like you lack you know so the imposter syndrome there are real feelings that we wrestle with on here and I wrestled with them for a long long time but then there's the other side of that is that is the importance we place on that so the fact that I well I don't feel good enough I, I can't write a book about this because I'm not good enough I'm, like, look at all those experts out there they've already written on this topic like who am I to write about this or who am I to do xyz I'm just not good enough and it's like well 
why does being good enough even matter? Like the thing, the thing about I'm not good enough is, is we never finish the sentence. So it makes it really easy to hook onto because it's so vague that there's always something that you can go, well, of course I'm not good enough. Well, you know what? If you said to me, Adita, look, you're just not good enough to play tennis at Wimbledon. I'm like, yeah, I know. And I'm totally fine with that. Don't have a problem with that at all. Whereas, you know, if you say you're not good enough to be like, to do the work you're doing, I'm like, mm, okay, now, now this starts to kind of come close to my heart a little bit and I feel a little bit you know, uncomfortable. So finish the damn sentence already. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then you can start working with that. What do you not feel good enough about? So pin that one down and then also make it not matter. Wow. Like it literally doesn't matter that you're not good enough. There are loads of people doing stuff out there and they're not good enough too, but they still manage to be wow. successful in doing whatever they want to do, right? So yeah, th that's what I've got to say about that. <laughs> oh, wow, that's so cool. I, I love it, I love it, I love it. You are so right, people. That's it, that, that's, that's the hell they say, I'm not good. I'm not good. I'm like, I'm not yeah. good at anything, basically, right? Oh my God, it's so, you are so right. Never thought about it from this angle, you know, finish the bloody sentence. Yeah. Wow. And why is it even important? Is it even important? You know, no, it's and, not. and the other, the other thing I real, was realizing the other day as well, I don't know where it came from, but so I don't know if you've ever done, you know, the, the way they say, you know, oh, remind yourself about your greatness and that kind of stuff and put a list of all your achievements. You know, oh, I was a, you know, a grader. I was, I finished university, blah, 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 all kind of things. And I used to do this exercise and wasn't doing <laughs> yeah. it good to me at all. And then, and then I realized, but what are the other things where I don't have any certificate? Is there anything in my life that I've achieved and I'm proud of? that they don't grade, they don't give certification for, like even give, giving a birth, having yeah. a baby, or coming out of like, I went through a very tough separation with my partner and I came out of it all by myself. I mean, those kind of things, right? What do you mean you're not good enough? Like look yeah. at all this, this the, the stuff, and every single person, I believe, has stuff like that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And also, I think, like, when you think about the I'm not good enough thing, you know, how often do you find yourself saying about other people, well, I don't know why they're doing that because they're just not good enough for that. Like, I never say that. It never occurs to me to kind of judge somebody and go, well, they're not good enough. You know, that accountant, I don't know why he's an accountant because he's just not good enough numbers. Or whatever, like... It is never, I, I never say that. It's not even, doesn't even cross my mind. So we always think that these are things that people are saying. No, they're not. They're too busy thinking that they're not good enough for what they're doing. Everybody is too worried about their own state of affairs mm -hmm. to even be throwing judgments across the table to you. And if they are, well, that's all about them anyway. So mm -hmm. don't worry about them. You just do you yeah. Yeah. and just get your house in order. And so what if you're not good enough? So what? Are you having fun doing it? Well, then that's great. If you're not having fun doing it, stop. <laughs> exactly. And I say, you know, when you frame everything as a play, which I have been embracing, it's work in progress, of course. But every time I say it's a play, you know what? All the fear disappears because why? There is no failure because there are no expectations. It's a play. <laughs> you know, we, yeah. are, we play a play for the sake of play. You know? Yeah. <laughs> So, and I think to approach things in your business like an experiment, like a play, mm -hmm. well, I'm just going to try and do it this way, see what happens. If it doesn't work, I'm going to try it a different way tomorrow. Yeah. Like with launches, you know, people put a lot of importance, and I've done this, and I think I've got launch, uh, like launch trauma, which I still probably need to work on, is, you know, you do the thing and you're like, oh, I'm going to get like, you know, this five-figure launch or the six-figure launch, whatever it is that you say, and then and then it all goes horribly wrong because whatever, because there's so many moving parts. And, and and you've placed a lot of, like, you've put all your eggs into that and you've built everything up. Whereas if you go, oh, I'm just going to try doing this thing this week and do it this way and see if that works. And if it doesn't, then I might tweak that and that. We'll, we'll see what happens. And you go into it a lot lighter. You're not kind of going in with everything and it all feels so heavy and it's got to work because, you know, you've put it all in. You're playing with it and you can pivot and you can change. 
that lightness of being can really help you because you're not because you can change if you need to mid 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 thing you know rather than having it I you've planned it all everything's got it you know then this is back to the linear thinking I've got to plan my launch to the x degree because it all and, and yes launches big launches have a lot of moving parts and you do need to plan them but is there flexibility in there is there a play attitude in there where you can mix it up if you want to and you can react and change some people haven't got that flexibility and um agility to change mid 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 thing because they've put so much in and it's all very rigid in that direction so it, it's an attitude it's a way that you approach something but also if you build it for like that from the outset you allow the play you allow the mid point pivot whatever you want to call that to take place so create that to allow that to happen rather than close it all off you know there are ways of bringing play into what you do yeah and i think that agility you mentioned you know is totally developed and you develop it by doing it <laughs> yeah you know yeah i lovely lovely chat and i'm just looking at the time um i could chat forever I, I what I, I wanted to ask you about your book we before we finish tell tell us a little bit about your book okay so I've got well I've got two I'm presuming that you want well there's the fearless birthing book and then there's a clear head trash book. I guess yes that this so probably this one for the most part <laughs> for my listeners <laughs> yeah so if you want to clear your head trash using head trash clearance then this is a book that you need um which is it within the book is the diy version of head trash clearance which means you can basically start clearing your head trash clearing your fears your anxieties everything that in that is what i use to clear my topophobia myself in three months which apparently can't be done and i have people that and i've got a membership with, which gives people a, like enables them to um use that method and give them everything they need to go get get some amazing results and, and I'm not part of that I've just created lots of resources for people and I have people in there that have healed their own depression and tocophobia on their own in less than two months so it's a very very powerful healing modality that you can achieve amazing results on your own of course if you work with someone like me or people I've trained then you can there's a lot more that you can achieve but it's it's a very powerful one that you can start changing how you feel about anything very very quickly and it's all in that book so perhaps this is the best first step people can actually make, getting your book. Yeah, um, listening to the podcast, The Head Trash and Healing Show. I talk a lot about the method and how I'm using it and how you can you know, think about your own head trash to start healing. So the podcast is also a good place to start as well. And there's lots of, I've created, because my background marketing and comms and branding <laughs> business, I've also created lots of healing products. So if people want to check out healing products at the website, Clear Head Trash website, then there's wound healing products, fear clearance products, like courses, like things that you can do to kickstart your healing journey if you want to do that on your own. Of course, you know. It's so funny, but, right? I'm a marketer as well. I Well, in my corporate career, I was in IT. Now, then I became a, an online marketer. Now I'm talking about healing and all that kind of stuff. And I was like thinking to myself, what what in the world is going on? You know, now I'm prepping to record a to create a small product, you know, on the on on that topic as well. It's like, what is this like me marketer speaking about whatever, you know, those kind of things. Anyway, so really, really, really cool to have you on my podcast. Thanks so much. And the final question before I ask you the very final question: When you hear the name from from grind to grace, what comes to your mind? Your perspective. It is that stopping the hustle and allowing the flow to come in so I think I'd probably say from hustle to flow if I was to kind of reflect that back. that's that's what comes to me and also grace is that um that ability to maybe communicate with people with grace which is that compassionate um lack of judgment you know where you can hold somebody and walk them through something without making them feel crap about maybe their inadequacies you know you can hold them through that and yeah. space which i think we need a lot more of that yeah today. thank thank you so much for for your perspective uh love it love it so where can people find you what is the best place the best place is clearyourheadtrash.com where i've mentioned there's books healing products you can work you know work with me i also if people are if they're if 
coaches or therapists or healers listening and they would like to learn head trash clearance then you can go to headtrashclearance.com and um, I'm running I do training professional training practitioner training so there's a cohort opening in September so yeah if you want to add head trash clearance to your box of tricks tools and techniques it works brilliantly well obviously business coaching I use it all the time in my marketing mentor and business coaching but also as a pure healer I it's funny I find that my prices or the, the, what I'm able to command as a healer is now exceeding my business coaching, which I think I've got to sort my pricing out because, because the results are so rapid that people want that rapid change in healing because the head trash clearance does. I mean, just to give you an inkling of the speed, I had a therapist coming to me for work. She had tocophobia, clinical um, anxiety disorder and OCD. And we got rid of all of those in five weeks. And she came to me just for tocophobia, the OCD, and the anxiety were just freebies that just came as a result of the work that we did on the tocophobia. So that's how fast I work with people. And so if you're a healer or therapist and you wanna get those kind of results, then maybe you wanna think about training in head trash How about that speed and personal growth, folks, huh? No, right. That is crazy. crazy, that is crazy. Honestly, like, you know, reading books and after book, after book, after book, you know, think I'm grow rich, you know, all good books, but, it's years and years and years and years of of getting to that place where you can actually do the thing. So, so really appreciate that you know you for what you're doing. Very much, very much needed. And I I will put the links in, in the show notes, obviously, uh, so everyone can find you who is interested. And I would really encourage people to start doing this it's it's precious it's precious so thank you so much thank you thank you beautiful insights lots of them and i'm sure we could talk more and perhaps we will but for today thank you so much appreciate you until next time and thanks everyone for listening hope you got lots of usefulness from this and i can't wait to see you on my next episode bye for now bye